Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks very much for inviting me here to speak to you uh, this afternoon. Uh, I'm talking to you about fish. So since fish eat bugs and plants, and they're eaten by otters and bitterns, I think I'm right in the middle of everything here. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, three parts. What is an eel? Why are eels important? And what are we doing about it? So to start with what is an eel, and this, when I talk about eels here, I'm talking about the ones you might think of as the freshwater eels. There are 19 species of these eels around the world. Um, the, the bold black lines show you the distributions of these different eel species around the world. So you can see they really are global. But the one I'm talking about today is the European eel. Now eels are part of our culture, and uh, somebody even Earlier on today, we pointed out that eels foot in. Uh, that's the closest I can get to an example of how there are cultural phenomenon within this part of the world. Uh, the gentleman on the other side there is actually from the Maori nation in New Zealand. And I met um, a relative of his several years ago at another conference. Uh, and he stood up at an eel conference and told everybody that he could trace his Maori ancestry back to an eel. And then he challenged as, as scientists, to be that involved in the eel. So that's, you know, you can't get more, more cultural than that. Um, and I couldn't match up his challenge, I'm afraid. So the European eel is the Anguilla Anguilla. Um, that should be the last time I use a Latin name here today. Um, and, but where does it come from? Well, this is one of the first mysteries that's puzzled people for thousands of years. The ancient Greeks, Aristotle, he had some ideas. Um, various ideas have been that it's earthworms that have fallen into the rivers. Uh, even more, that it's the hair from the horse that's fallen into the river. But the, the, the Latin name actually gives us a bit of uh, a clue to here. Only about a hundred years ago, scientists finally decided that the European eel, Anguilla Anguilla, probably originates in the Sargasso Sea uh, in the Caribbean area. And the, the brightest red area there is roughly the Sargasso Sea here. Um, so near Anguilla and near the Bermuda Triangle, if we want to carry on with the mystery. Um, and what, the way they found this out was they used very fine mesh nets um, surveying across the oceans and looking for the tiny larvae of the eel. And the smallest ones they found were within that red area. And so they got larger as they got further away, so they backtracked and said, the spawning ground of the European eel must be in that area. A hundred years on, that's it. That's all we know. Okay, we don't know anything better than that. We still have not seen a spawning eel in the wild. We do catch larvae in those areas, but we still haven't seen the, the adults. And just on the, on the far side there, that's um, a, a leptocephali, a larvae of one of the eel species. Now, how long does it take them from the Sargasso to get to us? We're not really sure. It might be about six months. It might be up to three years, depending on the way that you look at it. But when they do come to us, to our shores, um, by that time, they've turned into what we call the glass eel, which is more, it's the shape of the, the traditional eel that you can think of, but it's see-through, it's got no pigment, so we call it a glass eel. And these are his um, on your left-hand side. And they come to our waters across Europe and northern Africa um, and into the Mediterranean. Uh, and this mental note for me down here is the fact one of the first important things to know about the European eel is that the entire population is what we call panmictic. And what that means is that there's one population of European eel throughout the whole of Europe, Northern Africa, Scandinavia, and the Mediterranean. Okay? So even if we're looking at eels in the Sargasso Sea, we are talking about eels in Suffolk. Because the, the adults in Suffolk rivers, they go off to the Sargasso Sea and they spawn and then their progeny might turn up in Portugal or Norway or Greece. And the cycle goes on and on and on. So they're all one single stock. The next thing to note 
is that although I called them freshwater eels at the beginning, they're not all freshwater. They don't all have to come into freshwater at all. Um, in fact, we now know that some of the eels come back, but they only come into our coastal waters, and they live and they grow there all the way until they're ready to go back to the spawning grounds. Whereas others come into estuaries, others come into our fresh waters. And particularly the ones that come into estuaries and fresh waters, some of them stay there and others will go up and down, up and down, several times throughout their life cycle. So they use the whole variety of habitats. And the reason we know this is because we look at the, the chemistry of uh, bones and mineral deposits within the eel itself. And this slide on the, the bottom right there shows you a section through uh, an otolith, which is an ear stone inside the eel. Um, and the chemistry of the water that it lives in and also what it eats is laid down in that, in that ear stone. And when we slice it through and stain it, we get what you can just about should be able to make out there are these darker and lighter rings. And we use these exactly the way that we count the years, the age of a tree. These are the rings that you, we can use to age the eel. So this tells us how old it is. Also, depending on the, the size of the, the gaps between the rings, tells us how fast or slow it grew at different times. Um, and also, because we can look at the chemical composition, we can see whether it was in freshwater, the marine, or in brackish waters as well. So we get all that just from the chemistry of these little ear stones. So they come into fresh water, either by swimming or, in some cases, just crawling over wet grass, wet mud, wet rocks. Um, I have seen this on the sides of waterfalls, but I've never personally seen eels going across a wet field. Um, but I think Carl probably has places where he's pretty sure it's happened. But they come into fresh water, they inhabit our rivers, our lakes, our ponds, our estuaries, um, and they grow for a while. But what do they do? Your guess is as good as mine. Obviously, they live there. They feed on things. They eat. They grow. Other things eat them. Um, but we really don't know what it is that they do while they're here. We know more than that. Eventually, they want to go back to the Sargasso Sea to spawn. Now, we know that they, they have to be typically at least 35 centimeters, uh, it's 14 inches in old money, um, before they start the journey back. Um, we do understand that because they've got to get to the Sargasso Sea, they need to have energy stores. And as best as we can understand, they don't feed after they leave our fresh waters. So they swim all the way across the ocean without feeding. And therefore, they need to have a certain amount of fat uh, stores within them. So typically, they've got to have at least 15% fat. Um, we can't t tell just by looking at them if they're male or female, except for the fact that the males go back when they're shorter than the females. So typically, if the eel is more than about 45 centimeters long when it is leaving the river, it's almost certainly a female. The males go out when they're smaller. The females obviously have got to invest a lot of time and a lot more energy in, uh, in making eggs when they get to the sargasso, so they leave it much longer than the males do. Uh, and I leave with the question of where do they actually go in the oceans, and how do we look into that? Well, to go back 25 years, since that's the theme of the conference, scientists were trying to follow the eels when they left the rivers. And they did that by putting uh, an acoustic transmitter onto an eel and then following it with a ship. So basically, you can imagine we had the eel, and then above it was this huge ship following it for a few days in coastal waters. Um, that was the state of the science. Uh, and you can imagine, well, I know how much it costs to put a ship in the water now. So you can imagine how much money that cost uh, just for one fish. Uh, and they didn't get them very far, as you can imagine. What we do now um, is that we put satellite tags onto silver eels. And that's the, the one in, in my hand there, that's a satellite tag there. Now, to be fair, they were designed for tracking the movements of great white sharks and whales and walrus, okay? So they're, they're relatively big to put on a silver eel, for sure. And we did, when we did this study in Ireland, um, we worked with Irish fisheries and they went through 20 tons 
of silver eels to get us 40 eels that were big enough for us to tag. But they did it, not me, so that was fine. Um, and the way it works is we tag the, the eel, swims off out into the ocean, and at a preset time, the tag pops off from the eel, floats to the surface, and then sends the signal back. Um, it has to be on the surface to get the signal back to the satellite. And so we did this in a, an EU-funded project called Iliad. Um, we didn't get them all the way to the Sargasso Sea, okay? So, so that still uh, remains just now. We did manage to track them as far as the Azores. So they were heading in the right direction, um, but that was after many months. So um, the idea that they would only take six months to get there, our eels would never have got to the Sargasso Sea within six months. Now, the things we learned from them, the chart on the top there uh, has two things that you want to, to look at. First of all, on the, the y-axis, so up and down, that's the depth of the eel during a day. Actually, this is two days. Um, it starts um, at nighttime, then it goes into the daytime when it's down low, and then nighttime again, daytime, nighttime. So what that's telling you is at nighttime, the eels are actually relatively close to the ocean surface. I say relatively close, they're still about 400 meters deep. But during the daytime, they're down about 800 to 1,000 meters deep. And they do this almost every day. And we've now colleagues on the, on, in America who are working on the American eel, they've seen they do the same thing. And we know that eels in other places, they do the same thing. This is a behavior that we see in these species in the oceans around the world. Um, yeah. Now, the other thing that we get from this information, and you probably won't be surprised to, to hear, that quite a lot of our tag deals were eaten. You know, they, did, they didn't even get as far as the Azores. And because there's a temperature sensor in the tag, uh, we can tell what they were eaten by in some situations. And that's what these pictures show here. Um, we've had eels that were eaten by whales, by sharks, and by just big fish. That's just an, an example on the bottom there. And the reason we know that is because when they're eaten by the whales, the whales are like us. They're quite warm inside. So we could see from the temperature record on the tag when the tag went into the whale. And as we can see when it comes back out again into the cold water. And I'll leave it to your imagination how that happens. Um, we also see in the, the sharks, some of the sharks are kind of midway. They're, they're warmer than the water, but they're not as warm as the whales. So we could see that as well. So we see a lot of predation. But I, I must point out that we also see this in eels that we've tagged with much smaller tags that go on the inside. So this is not a feature of the fact that we're putting a giant submarine on top of a silver eel. <laughs> um, or at least not only. So what's so important about eels? Why am I up here today? Why, you know, why do I get funding to do this work? Well, they make a lot of money for people. There are fisheries across Europe and beyond. Um, estimates from around about 2000, there were about 25,000 people around Europe who were involved in the eel fishery. Uh, they're, they're eaten in a variety of ways, jelly deals, smoked eels, um, uh, various Japanese recipes, and the glass eels there on, on the top. Particularly in terms of the glass eels, they're an extremely valuable resource. Um, a few years ago, and I'll come later on, I'll explain the reasons, but a few years ago, a kilogram of glass eels could be sold for five or six hundred pounds. And in actual fact, to, well, this year in North America, a kilogram of their glass eels could fetch $7,000, okay? So, and you go out at night, and if you can find a good spot to fish, you can fish a few kilos a night. So you can make, you know, somebody can make a lot of money. Um, and as you can imagine, they're quite protective about their little fishing areas. So they've got very important fisheries. Uh, and particularly in Northern Ireland, we have one of the biggest uh, silver eel fisheries in Europe. And we have a large glass eel fishery in the Severn Estuary. They're also very important in the ecosystem. Um, as I said before, they eat a lot of things, a lot of things eat them. But 
in actual fact, there's, as I'll show later, there are far fewer eels than there used to be, and we don't really know what that means for the ecosystem. I managed to get otters in here. Just, just otters, okay. Yeah. Somebody get me a picture of a bittern eating an eel. The problem, as I said, is that they're disappearing. Uh, and the take-home message is there's about 5% of the babies now as there were in the 1970s. But the way we'll show this is the chart on, the, on your left-hand side, the blue and the, the red lines are just two different data series. Up the top there, that's the 1950s to the 1980s, and then the decline. This is the decline in, in the uh, proportions of small baby eels coming back to our waters. And see, from about 19, early 1980s, they've crashed. They crashed all the way down, and there have been a few blips along the way, but they're, they're at low. So they're now 5% of what they were before. And the reasons why um, are probably a whole host of reasons, and some of them will be more important than others in different places. Climate change, uh, we know that there are lots of changes to the ocean conditions, uh, particularly currents and the temperatures. I mean, you imagine these tiny little larvae that are no, you know, no longer than your finger um, and much, much thinner. They're not actively swimming across the Atlantic. They're at the mercy of the currents. And if those currents change, you know, then maybe they're not coming to us. Fisheries, no doubt in some places, fisheries have taken massive numbers of eels out of waters particularly in the glass eel fisheries, in some places in France where they've got a big dam built at the top of the estuary. That basically holds up all of the glass eels. And then they've got people in boats with fine mesh nets. And they just go around and they hoover up the glass eels. So in places, the fisheries will have had a big impact. Habitat loss. We've, we've seen quite a few examples today of habitat loss. Up here on the, the top there, um, that's tidal bar barriers holding back tide uh, waters. And that, in the foreground there, that ought to be um, a drainage ditch or a stream or a barn. Um, but now it's just cow habitat. It should be eel habitat, not cow habitat. So we've lost that. Hydropower in the middle here. Uh, eels, anything that's long and thin, they don't go through water power turbines very well. And that's the result uh, more often than not. Water quality and pollution, we've heard about the PCBs that were uh, damaging the otters. There's a good chance that some of those PCBs were in the eels first. Um, and we think, fairly sure, that they do a lot of damage to the eels as well. The problem is that the effects happen out in the ocean. So it's difficult to see and it's difficult to follow. Diseases and parasites. This lovely picture here on the side here is a, a, a worm that lives inside the swim bladder of the eel. And the swim bladder is a sort of a balloon inside the eel, which it inflates and, and makes smaller. And that helps it control its buoyancy within the water. But when it's got lots of these parasites in it, both when they're there, they make it difficult to, to function. Also, they live in, the, in the, the skin of the balloon. And once they've been there, they make scar tissue, which means it's not, near, it's not so elastic. And it just makes it far less well to function. And predation, we've got predation as well. And as I say, all of these will have an effect in some places at some times. So what are we doing about it? Well, the scientific community at least recognized there was a lot of problems with this decline in recruitment from the late 90s and early 2000s. And so the scientific community internationally were calling for, for action. Lots of other people have been calling for action of, you know, much longer than that and still do. Um, because it's one population of eels across Europe and beyond, there's actually was introduced a European legislation. Uh, and I realize that today in particular, it's, it's quite apt to be talking about European legislation. But this one uh, was brought in, and this made it the obligation for all European countries with eels to do something about recovering their stocks. The third one there, CITES, that's when there was an international ban on the trade of eel. And that's, that's, for us, it means that you can't export eel outside of Europe. Uh, and it used to be, and the reasons why the prices were so high, was that our glass eel were being caught here and then shipped to China and Japan, where they were growing up in, uh, in aquaculture, in eel farms. And it was the Chinese and the Japanese who were prepared to pay so much money 
for the glass seals. They've put a stop on that since uh, 2009, and that's why now the American eel is worth so much, because those markets can't get the European eel, so they just went somewhere else in the world and pay more. And then it's also on the IUCN uh, red list, and it's, it's classed as critically endangered. Uh, it's worth making the point there that we're still talking about a species that exists in terms of billions of individuals, okay? Um, but it's got an endangered uh, classification that's worse than pandas. Um, and it's because of the way the criteria work. Because there's been a 95% reduction in recruitment, it is classed as critically endangered. And it's one of these things where the eel, it just doesn't quite fit, you know, with, with, with some of these other things. So f this European legislation required countries to produce eel management plans. And those management plans say that you've got to assess your eel production, you've got to identify and address the impacts, and you've got to report progress regularly. And it's done at the eel management plan, the eel management unit level. And within, the, within England and Wales, this is akin to the River Basin District. So the, the whole of the Anglian region is one management unit for, for eels. And there are 11 of them in England and Wales. Uh, one, obviously, shared, uh, two, sorry, shared with, with Wales. So the challenge, therefore, is to work out how many eels we've got. Um, the ideal would be to count them into your river and count them out again. But that's just impossible to do in, in almost all circumstances. So what we have to do is to use what the data we do have, which are from the yellow eel surveys. So those are surveys of the eel when they're in their growth phase. Um, and for my EA colleagues here in particular, I must say, when I say we here, this is the EA who do these surveys. And I just help them out with building the assessments. But with these eel surveys, it's not about what we catch. The real challenge is counting what we don't catch because that's the actual number we need to have. Now, in small streams uh, where we do electrofishing surveys, it's, it's relatively straightforward. You can net at either end, you can fish through a few times, and you can get an idea. The problem is that those streams are actually only a very small part of our eel habitat. The pie chart on the, on the far side there, um, you see the rivers are only a small section. There's a roughly the same amount of wetted area of lake, but then when you take into account the estuaries and the coastal waters, that's far greater, and we don't have any survey data for them. So that's where we're bringing in the science and how we can improve our methods and develop methods so we can survey the eels in these open waters. And one of the studies that we've, we've done in the last few years was looking at the, the movement of eels in Pool Harbour. And what we have, the, the blue on your right-hand side there is Pool Harbour down in the south coast, and we have two rivers running into it. And we put little acoustic transmitters. It's akin to the radio tags that you've seen other people using on, on uh, animals and birds. We put them inside the fish, and then we track their movements. And what we found from that was that fish are moving from one river into the estuary and back into the other river and back again. So, so it's all one population. Um, and they're doing this every night. You know, every night they'll make a movement of about five or six kilometers, going out and back and out and back. And as I say, they do it at night. On, the, on your left here, um, we have the time when the eels start this movement every night. Uh, and actually, the top there uh, is not midnight, it's dusk, that's right, it's dusk. So they're, they're moving, they're starting their movement around about dusk. And then over on the far side there, that's when they finish, that's when they come back to home. And that's always just a little bit before dawn. So they're out from dusk till dawn. So obviously, light levels and light conditions are important to, to the eels in terms of this behavior. And the bit in the middle uh, is a reminder to me um, to say that this is something where we, we need to be conscious of what we're doing to the light environment uh, within, within nature. 
particularly now when our street lights are being changed and replaced for much brighter, much whiter lights. So we're effectively trying to recreate daylight conditions at nighttime. Um, we have to be mindful about what this does for, for our animals and perhaps for our plants. Um, certainly it's great for us, but you know, we have to be mindful of what this might be doing for an eel when the eel needs darkness to cue these behaviors. Uh, and a couple of years ago, I saw a program on our local news which was saying how fantastic it was to be producing these, these new lights and also that they'd put covers on them so that none of the light went up into the sky and so, which meant it was much better for the stargazers to see the, the, the planets and the stars and everything like that. They completely missed the point that that meant all the light was shining down onto our land and onto our rivers and turning night into day. So we have to be mindful of these things. The, an, another study we're doing similar methods is, is where to set our surveys within lakes. And this picture up here is, and the, and the words there are particularly to remind you that, and others have done it already today, we don't only work where it's sunny, you know, we, we do have to go out in all sorts of weather, even when it's chucking it down with rain. Here we're working in a lake, uh, actually in, in Norfolk originally, but we're now working in Hanningfield Reservoir, um, so we've skirted Suffolk. Uh, and it's the same technology, we're putting acoustic transmitters inside the eels and we're using a, automatic receivers to detect their locations, but we have enough receivers around that we can actually triangulate the positions of the eels and look to see how they move around. And what we find from the, from the small lake study so far is we have some eels uh, that are don't move very far. And on your left-hand side here, we've got two eels, the red one and the green one. You can see the red one in particular doesn't go very far within a, a couple of days. The green one, far more. And then on the, your right-hand side there, there's another eel, another individual, and it uses the whole of the water body. And actually, that happens to be a larger eel than the ones on the left. Uh, and that is borne through by all of the other eels that we've studied. The big ones, tend to just go everywhere, whereas the smaller ones are much more confined. And what's crucial for us is that if we, we need to know that information, because if we go out and try and net them, and then we use that netting information, that trap information, to work out what, what population we've got, um, if we all set our nets at the top of the pond there, we'll miss everything in the bottom, we won't get the little ones, and the chances are we'll get an artificially high uh, idea about the size structure of eels within the, the pond. So we need to understand what they're doing before we can go out and fish them. So what's next for eels within the UK? Well, you know, the, t the talk was entitled The Mystery and the Science. Um, and as a scientist, I'm glad to say that there's still a great deal of mystery about the eels. Uh, but we need to understand how we can do our assessments better. As I say, at the moment, we're, working, we're basing our entire UK assessments of eel on what we can catch in waters that are literally no deeper than this podium. Um, and that's, we've got to do better than that. We need to understand our impacts uh, and where these are having the effects, and we need to have solutions. But time marches on, and the European legislation says that we have to take uh, action, and we have to report this every three years. So we do have to keep going and just learning as we go along um, to improve our assessments. And we, this is the reporting schedule along the bottom there. We've done 2012, we've done 2015, we're now looking at 2018 as the next time we have to report. Okay, that's, that's me for today. So just let's thank you very much for, for your attention and to thank the Yale and a variety of people who've helped with this uh, science as we've gone along. Thank you.